Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. Pray for grace and more deserving of prayer, but because uh, we steer the ship. <laughs> I don't think anything that revolves around us, but uh, we just want to make sure we don't steer the ship on the rocks, you know. Uh, we want to be, make sure that we keep uh, uh, the, the people on the ship uh, uh, focused on the right things and not trying to sink the ship, you know. Uh, these are the things that we try to do, and so uh, your prayers are important to us. I hope that you see that uh, I put time into trying to produce messages that speak to your lives. Uh, it's not always easy. It's not simple. It doesn't come naturally. It requires work, time, thought process. And for a guy like me, it takes even more. I have to go the average guy because my mind doesn't work as clearly as some. But on the other hand, I will work, work, work to get it done. Your prayers help me to get that accomplished. So thank you uh, for that. Today, we have one slide we're going to put up on the screen. It's called, and it says on the screen, Avoiding Chaos. Avoiding Chaos. I want you to get that into your mind uh, tonight. You know, as you mature as a Christian, your focus begins to shift. It begins to shift from yourself. Are you paying attention? Yeah. Are you mature? It shifts from yourself, meaning your needs, your desires, your problems, to other people's needs, desires, and their problems. Now, let's make it clear. It doesn't mean that your needs, desires, or problems are not important. They are. But on the other hand, the job of God's people and God's workers is to be able to reach out and help people. Our, look at what Jesus did. He fulfilled his role as Savior. He went up on the cross. The Bible says we talked about it not long ago. He emptied himself. And what did he do? He took on the nature of a servant. It was no longer about him. It was about others. You mature, not when you're in ministry and show up and do a task in the church. You mature when you show up at church and say, who can I help? Who can I bless? Who can I encourage? When you think about your day, not how much money you can make and the things you can gather and all the good things that you can bring to yourself, but how can I do more for God and honor God? All the blessings will come automatically if you will focus on that. Our yearly theme is to focus our attention theme this year is to focus our attention on the chaos that exists in the world today. What do we mean by chaos? The state of confusion and disorder that exists because people no longer care about God. Not that they ever have in our lifetime. We've never seen people care about God. But it gets worse and worse as the days go on. And we have a duty and a responsibility to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to help them and to bless them. Can you say amen? New Harvest Church here in Manchester, we exist because we desire to influence people towards Christ. That is our goal and our desire. We want to be the salt that the Bible speaks about. We desire to be the light that the Bible speaks about. We often, and I want you to catch this, we often hinder accomplishing that goal because we ourselves can sometimes be chaotic. We are chaotic. How can we reach those who are in the chaos? So catch with me here. I'm trying to help you tonight. We should be bringers of clarity to a chaotic world. We are to clarify the truth. We are to bring understanding, not more confusion. Sometimes people, Christians, they're well-intentioned, but sometimes they talk to people, and because they're so chaotic and they're coming from such a chaotic place, but they end up just confusing people more than helping them. They end up talking about all kinds of things. I remember being on outreach, I was here in Manchester, 
remember, I'll never forget it. We're, nice day, we're playing music, talking to lots of people. And one of the, the ladies from the church comes up to me uh, and says, oh, can you talk to this person? And I said, sure, what's going on? She goes, and she wants to know all about the Holy Spirit. This is a person that didn't even know Jesus yet. She didn't want to know about the Holy Spirit. That person wanted to tell her about the Holy Spirit. See, that's our problem sometimes. It brings chaos to an already chaotic world. We should be, be people that bring clarity. And this is what I want to get out today in communion box. We often add chaos and confusion to people's lives, even here in the church, by the way that we live our lives, by the things we're doing or not doing that we should be doing. And I'm convinced, and I want you to catch this, I know you've heard it probably said to a little child, that our lives speak louder or more than our words do. See, it is true that words do make impact. Words are important. That's why you can't yell fire in a crowded theater without being arrested. Because it's illegal to do that because that word fire sends a message out, right? And if you do it, it, it and if there's not a fire, then you're going to be arrested for that. Because if you didn't mean what those words were saying. And that's the same thing is true with us, is that our words make impact, but they only make impact, listen to this, when we live lives that support what we're saying. We live lives that support and back up and exemplify what we are saying. This is why Jesus makes this crystal clear when he speaks and he says this, that the world will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. I want you to catch that. Not the world will know you are uh, his disciples by your love for the world, which has its place, but it's exemplifying Christ's love to one another. Because here's the truth. If you can't love a brother or you can't love a sister the way that God says in Christ, then there is no chance, zero chance. Take it from the pro here. Of you being able to love somebody outside the church. If you say, well, I like people outside the church more than I like church people, well, then you've got a problem. Then you've got an issue. Then your focus is all wrong. I don't want to get off on too many details. I want to make the point, though, that our lives speak more than our words do. So back to this issue of chaos. I am convinced that people cause their own chaos. They blame it on circumstances and people. They say, oh, this circumstance happened, and that caused chaos in my life. Well, this person, wherever they go, boy, there's just, here's a new word, drama. This is the young word, you know, for you. They're drama. You know, people always say, don't come to my house, because this is a drama-free zone. You know, when really what they're saying is, and I cause a lot of drama in this house. We don't need any more people bringing drama. And that's the reality of the situation. We often cause our own chaos, and until you recognize that, you will struggle. You will have problems. So you might be asking, Pastor, are there any particulars that you want to talk about or I should be aware of concerning chaos? Well, I'm glad you asked. I would like to look at one, one, one today that I think is a big issue in many people's lives. It's an issue in churches and jobs could be in clubs, people who have common themes, common interests in clubs. Whatever the case may be, but this is something that can cause undue chaos. And so I want to read for you out of this passage here in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, and verse number 4. This is the New Living Translation. I think it makes it clear. And I like how this man is able to see things clearly. He is not always right spiritually. Sometimes he's in a backslidden state, and he's saying things from the point of view of a backslider. And that doesn't mean that backsliders can't think a reason, because they can, but sometimes their spirituality isn't right. But I think here, as we read this, his observation is exact. and It's right on the money, as we like to say. He says, then I observed, 
that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. This thing that I want to talk about will cause you to chase the wind. And one of the greatest frustrations I've had as a pastor through the years trying to reach people, build a church, as they say. Uh, some people don't even like the term build a church. But the bottom line is that uh, chasing the wind, people just going through the motions, doing things with no impact, living their lives and just in a big whirlwind. As a person who cares about people, wants to see them achieve their maximum potential, that's frustrating. And so this causes us to chase the wind. And what's being described here today, being described, hey baby, you gotta sit down, mama. Okay, there we go. So what we're talking about today is a word that I want you to get etched in your mind. The word competition. Competition. What is competition? Well, competition in sports is good. It's good. It's good to have healthy competition when you're uh, uh, fighting with someone, isn't it? Uh, I mean, fighting, fighting, but I mean, in boxing, good competition. You're playing sports with someone, good competition. All of these things are good to be competitive at. Even in some work situations, hey, let's have a contest to see who has the most sales, you know. It's inspiring and motivates you, gives you something to work for. Hey, who can do the most collections this day? Wow, that's great. But in Christians and between Christians, in spiritual matters, competition is unhealthy. Now, there are several aspects to competition, but I like the definition that the Cambridge Dictionary gives it. It says uh, competition in one aspect is one upmanship. It says this is a situation in which someone does or says something in order to prove that they are better than someone else. And you know, it, it, it shocks me that as Christians we could actually have this going on between believers. I want to be better than you. That makes me think you don't even comprehend the gospel when you're like that. You know, the Bible makes it clear that without Jesus we are lost. We are terrible people. We are debased, which, look up the word, it's a bad word. And yet then all of a sudden we get saved, we get cleaned up, and now we have competition between our brother and sister. Now I want to tell you, first of all, that I don't think most people consciously compete. I don't people think, I don't think people come to church going, I'm going to compete with that guy, or these girls, I'm going to compete with these girls, or, or, or this situation. I think that they do it either subconsciously, or they begin to minimize the thing that they're doing as not that important and not that harmful by calling it something else, you know, by not saying it's a rivalry and not saying that it's one up and shit, not saying that I'm trying to gain advantage over another person. But yet we all know it's there. We all know it exists, even in marriages, husbands and wives, instead of assuming the role. It's like, who's in charge? Who's going to gain the upper hand? Get a leg up on the other person. See, that's what ends up happening. And what it does is it clouds our credit. So before I give you some help on how to get through this, I just want to kind of describe it for you. Because men and women compete differently. Women do things like this, that try to gain advantage over Someone else is trying to have one upmanship on another lady. And it goes on in the church, it goes on uh, with people in leadership and other aspects of ministry where they'll come in and they won't maybe not acknowledge another woman as they enter the room. They'll look at that woman just like, hey, let's go over here and kind of not acknowledge them. And they're doing that to let others know that they're not uh, 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 acknowledging them. So they kind of just do this little thing that they just kind of drift off. Not ever calling it sin, not ever calling it wrong, it's just how they are. And of course, no one knows exactly what they really mean, but in their heart they know. And what this can what can happen if it goes to the extreme is it begins to build informal groups within a group. 
instead of being the church, or the church of these people, and this people, the word that's been used a lot of times and accurately described it is called cliques. This happens often, especially amongst ladies. Now, they don't overtly do this. They keep it on the down low, oh, they, they have undercover, you know, and it may not come out with that exact um, uh, uh, intention to hurt the other person, but when they start drawing people to themselves and getting people to admire them, they, they just, oh, you know, and, and they, they become that kind of individual, and they like it, and they feel good, and they drew people away from that person that they're in competition with. Now, I've got more friends over here. I've got more likes on my Instagram and my Facebook I've got more people wrong to me when they come to church than to look at me. And you say, well, this is just petty stuff, Pastor. It doesn't matter. Look at a church our size is going to reach people and not be chaotic. We're going to deal with these things. And we're going to know way you can deal with them is by you dealing with them with you. Because you can't expect the leadership of the church to come like, okay, stop being petty here. Okay, you stop being jealous of her. Don't, don't, don't stop talking to her. That's immature. And you have to deal with yourself and recognize that that thing is within you. Sometimes they drop subtle negative remarks or body language. They clothe it in as if they didn't really mean it that way. But the reality is, it's competition, it's rivalry, it's one up and shit. For men, as you might expect, it's a tad more forceful in their competition. Sometimes we're like, I was watching the other day, animal show, you can learn a lot from animals, especially BBC animal programs, they actually give you lots of Strange <coughs> meat. <coughs> He's trying to put a hex on me. And I was watching a couple of uh, hippos fighting, and I thought to myself, that's how men fight. They got their mouths wide open, and they just kind of jaw and I, uh, sometimes men can show their competition like that. They like to exert their power to let their attention be made known. Yeah, you might be at this position, but don't you forget, I'm right here next to you. Both of we're just men. We're both men. Yeah, we're men with different gifts. Yeah, we're men with different talents. We're men with different positions. Yeah, we're men who get to do different things at this time in life. But the reality is, it's just competition. And remember what Ecclesiastes said, people like this are chasing the wind. <clears throat> so what makes this a problem? Why is this a problem? Why are you carrying on, Pastor, about this? I like what you said about the avoiding confusion and chaos, but I don't know why you're going about the competition. Here's why. Because the root of competition is pride and insecurity. Pride and insecurity. And if there's anything that the world needs less of, it's pride and insecure people. So understand with me today is that pride, we all know what pride is, it gives off an odor. It gives off an odor. And the truth is, is that it's one of those odors that you can't really put your finger on it. You ever go out to your house and there's something there and you're like, something smells. What is that? And, and you know, it happened to me just the other day. I was like, I got up in the morning and then I go up and do my thing in the morning and it's like dark. And I go, oh man, this smells bad. And I go, oh man, I wonder if it's the rubbish over here and it wasn't. I had put something, some food in the bin the other night before and it was just enough to like permeate the house. I really couldn't tell where it's from. That's what happens in pride. In pride. And that's why it's problematic when you're trying to reach people with the gospel. It's because it comes off and it's proud. Wow, God's not having any pride. God nails it right away. But people come in and they can tell, they can sense that there's that little division. You can tell at home. You know, when Gracie and I visit people, sometimes we'll go to their house and chat with them, maybe help them, counsel them, or what have you. And you can kind of tell when there's dissension in that home. You can kind of tell when there's pride and one up and shit and rivalry. Can I tell you something? You come, when you're in your home, you don't notice it. 
But people come from the outside and listen. In our church, it's going to be the same way. When a visitor comes in, they're going to notice things that you don't notice. They're going to go, what's that smell? You know, some people are more concerned with the fact that our building's old and a little bit musty than they are with a little bit of pride. And sometimes their name can be I want to fix the mustiness, but I'm more concerned with what's going on in your heart. Here's off an offensive odor. When pride is exerted in the form of rivalry, that we're talking about today, it changes the order of things. The proper order of things don't work out. Listen, Pastor Dave preached an excellent message on Sunday, didn't he? And one of the things he talked about was when God wanted to use him to lead songs. And he said, man, he didn't feel worthy. He felt like, hey, there's somebody else who can lead songs. Why are you choosing me? I was thinking that there was a flip side to that story. There were people probably in there going, why are they using me? Why is he get to lead songs? I should be getting to lead songs. Why, why, why? I've been here longer. I'm better. I can sing. He can't. What, what's the thinking behind that? See, that's what pride does. It changes the order of things. That's what competition does. It changes God's order into man's order. Well, I win, therefore I'm on top. I beat you, so therefore I win. That's why people uh, compete against each other over the silliest things. Over the silliest things. I remember getting a, a, a piece, I can't even say what it is, because I don't want you to take this to the bank here. <laughs> uh, I, I remember getting a piece of clothing uh, years ago. And I loved this clothing. It was like something I wanted, you know. I'm not all into clothes, but this particular thing, I wanted it. And I remember bringing it to church. I was so excited. And I wore it to church. And I brought it to church. And, uh, you know, I could tell. And I could feel the vibe. Like, why do you have that? You're a pastor. You don't have money. No, I didn't have money. That was true. But I didn't have to buy that. And then the other thing that made it worse was that same week, man, two guys, not one, but two guys came in with the exact same article of clothing. Man, you're a chick, bro. That's what you are. <laughs> but my point being is that this is what happens when people are proud and there's competition. See, and sometimes when people are so proud and so wanting to get what they want and so competitive even with their lives, the people at work or even here in the church, it's, it upsets the natural world of things, as we said. But it also can ruin the very thing that you want. How many saw the 1994 cartoon movie, The Lion King? I saw The Lion King. Most everybody's seen The Lion King. One of the most fabulous movies ever. I love it. It was great. And you remember that uh, Mufasa had died, right? And his son, Sim Simba? Yes, Simba. Simba. Yeah. yeah, Simba, thank you. Uh, Simba was supposed to take over, but Scar, Scar wanted what Simba had. And so he deceived him, he lied, he tricked, he was competitive, he pulled the church move, man. <laughs> That's what he did. That's what people in church did. They throw a deception, you know, they, they, they can't box it out. You don't see two brothers boxing it out for an extra position in the car park. That doesn't happen in church. But we pull a little, what in Spanish you call movida, pull a little movida, make a move. And that's what he did. The problem was, once Scar got what he wanted, once he won, it began to ruin the entire kingdom. The land was ruined. Uh, he was not the leader that he thought he was going to be. He wasn't, gonna, he wasn't as blessed uh, as he saw Mufasa and who Simba would be. And that's what happened with us. And this is why it's problematic. Instead of being fertile and growing and exciting and vibrant, it becomes a, a competition that becomes dark and ugly. That can happen in church, it can happen in jobs. If you're in, in business with someone, you have to be very careful that that competition doesn't override the goal of building the business. Same thing is true in marriages. I realize that sometimes you're just trying to figure out who does what, you know, and who's in charge of what. What position is there? You know, and you're kind of like fighting for this position in marriage. That's cool. But if that thing continues on, and every time an issue comes up, and you're fighting in that competition, that rivalry, you're going to chase the wind. Chase the wind. 
chasing it. It's problematic because competition squeezes out the possibility of a we. A we. See, God is not into a singular personal pronoun. I, me, you. He's into those plural personal pronouns. We, they, us. Bottom line, that's what God has desired. He desires church members, not celebrities. He's looking for heroes, not headliners. See, this is so important. Competition ruins that. You can't ultimately ruin God's plan, but you can destroy your own local assembly. You can do that through competition. See, competitive people, and it's a problem because competitive people exclude the possibility of rejoicing with those who rejoice. You know, every time someone gets something that they wanted, I try to find a way to rejoice with them. Don't you? You should. If someone got a new car, even if you need a new car, why you praise God for your new car. I'm so excited for your new car. I wish those brothers that went out and bought that article of clothing that I had, I wish they would have went to me and said, man, that is one nice little piece of clothing you've got on. I wish they had said, man, that is really awesome. I'm so glad because you're such a good guy. I wish they would have said that because I am a good guy. And I was a good guy and I was a good leader to them. For them to do that was hurtful. I didn't let them know because I'm a man. <laughs> but the truth is, it would have been so much better if they could have just because if it would have happened, vice versa, and I might have been a little bit jealous of them, I might have wanted what they have, I would have still put that aside, as, even if it was difficult, and said, hey, you know, I'm glad you got that, bro. I'm glad that's really nice. Praise God for that. Praise God. Competitive people exclude the possibility of rejoicing with those who rejoice. You know, as a pastor, Sometimes people strive a little bit. We can feel that striving, trying to get our leg up on them. And I, I just don't know why they do that, but they do. And, and, and the problem is, is that I want to be able to praise what they do. I want to be able to compliment who they are and the things that they want. I don't want to, but, but they're never content with that. They're, they're only content when they get to gloat, when they get to peacock and show all. See, I told you so. I told you. You know what? Those are some of the worst words in the world. I told you so. I told you so. You should have listened to me. I knew better. Fair enough. You know, you're a smart person. Praise God for you. But whatever you did today, you just ruined that horrible attitude you just had. That competitive spirit chasing the wind. Chasing the wind. You should let me compliment you. I know that you come gloating around me about how great you are and the things you do and don't do. And it hurts every single time. So what's the solution to competition? Because for some of us, it's just in us. My family that uh, members, the male family members are sports addicts. I'm probably the least sporty of all of them, mostly because I have to get away from it as a pastor. But we love sports, man. And when we play, it's like it's on. It's on. I have some friends that you know I played golf with. We used to play golf with years ago, and they couldn't even play golf without being competitive. <laughs> you know, there, there is com competition, and, and sometimes that's in you. But how do you pull back if it's in you? How do you if you feel that jealousy, that envy, as as Ecclesiastes said? What's the the, the, the the solution to this? You know, like many things, I want to use my typical solution: stop doing it. But it's easier said than done. So let me, before I finish here, let me give you a story that happened to me that was kind of illustrated what I'm going to talk about as we close. There was a guy that, when I went to work before, I was actually right at the time I got saved. I, I went to, I got put me in this job so I could become a Christian. And my job was a, a, a foreman over a section that had a few employees who were uh, under me. And for the 
water flow. And then there was another section, there was another foreman who was over his section. We had totally opposite sections. He was in distribution, which was getting the water out. I was in production, which was producing the water. So totally different thing, but equal positions in our own departments. But this guy, who had been in that position forever, was often upset with me. It's like he disliked me from day one. I could tell he just didn't like it. Our age difference was big, so that could have played into it. I was never really sure why. But at every turn, whenever our jobs or our guys that worked for us, whenever they had any kind of interaction, man, he always turned it into a big competition. It was always strife. It was always not cool, man. I hated it. It was, uh, it, it brought out the worst in me. Even though our guys would make things, and then before you know it's like a war with these two different departments, and there's no need for it at all. They're doing two totally different things. So I went through this for a number of years. Eventually, uh, the guy who was above us resigned. Uh, it was a water superintendent job. And this other guy who was the, my competition he was about to get ready to retire, so he wanted that job. He wanted that job really bad because, one, he was that kind of guy who worked with me. And the other thing, it was going to affect his retirement, so if he could work that job, he was going to make a lot of money if he could do that. So the, the director of public works, the guy who was in charge of the entire city, called us both in and says, look it, I have a dilemma here. Tom, you're qualified. Tom, we should be giving you the job. The guy's name, but the other guy uh, uh, here, uh, you know, I know you're retired. I don't know what to do. I'm in a dilemma. Do you guys have any anything to do with that guy? Was like all like pumped, like ready to fight for that job, you know. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do this job he's dealing with. And I said, you know what? You can give him a job. I got all I care about is that I get to do my projects. I just want to be able to do my projects without his interference. But if the job suits you, you can have it. Man, that guy was a lie. He was a lie. His whole attitude changed. We came to work and he was, hey, Tom, how are you doing? All right, man, everything good? I mean, he didn't talk to me like one day in three years. But he was totally had changed. He came in humble. His humility was changed the atmosphere of the entire place where we were at. Life at that job was great. I've never, ever forgotten it. And I came to this conclusion. Wherever there is humility, it changes the atmosphere of what's going on. A little humility injected into a relationship can bless that marriage. A little humility can make a ministry flow like a well-oiled machine. A little humility can begin to prosper the people of God. You know the crazy thing about that story that I'm telling you about here today is that that guy retired seven months later. I remember I put on, I even hosted a retirement party for him, and he was like shocked and all of that. I made sure everybody brought presents. We had this whole thing. I stood at the front door like an usher, because I'm not an usher in the church, so uh, I, I did that. He was like amazed at that. You know what happened a month after that? They gave me that job for free. They gave me that job. And they didn't, they didn't give me the starting pay. It usually takes you four years to get to the top. I said, well, I'm going to take it if I can get top pay. They said, we've never done that in the history of the city. I said, well, you never had me before, have you? They gave me top pay and a company car. They gave me top pay a year and a half. Later, we're going to get into that part of the story. But my point being is that humility changes things. But humility for so many people is so difficult. It's difficult because they fight against it. They feel like they're going to lose if they're humble. They don't like it. Or they wrongly apply it. They think humility is something that it's not. And so for humility to be effective, you must really understand it properly. So humility is how you view your importance. That's really what it comes down to. How important are you? And the reason I say you must apply it properly, because some people say, well, if I'm humble, that 
means I must view myself as not important. No, you are important, but you're just not important in the role that you're trying to assert yourself into. You're important, but not at this time, or at this moment, or in this venture. You're important, but you're not all important. See, so humility is knowing your importance and recognizing your importance and operating in that level of importance that God has given you. This is why finding the role in marriage, husband and wife, is sometimes a little bit of a, of a dance, you know. It's like a little bit of a dance, of like who's, who's in charge, you know. But to me, it's sometimes like a boxing dance, you know. <laughs> but the point being is that humility is not saying I'm not important. It's learning to find your role in your importance. It's saying my importance matters, but in this situation, in this circumstance, in this position, my importance needs to take a back seat to this other individual's importance. See, and what I'm saying is that you do this willingly, not out of obligation, not out of reluctance. Well, they're the pastor, so let's go to the pastor now. Oh, that's Sister Tracy, well, that's my husband. I've got to submit to him. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That's a petulant child. That's juvenile. Uh, juvenility at, 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 at a large degree. That's being very, very uh, infantile, I'll even say. Humility in relationships is more than just understanding your role in that relationship. It is important that you understand this is the leader, this is not the leader, this is the wife, the husband, the pastor, the, the whatever. This is not uh, 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 what... That's not just humility. It's trusting that God will make the best out of a situation that you may not be 100% happy with. You may not be 100% happy with who's over you at work. You may not be 100% happy with your husband or your wife taking the role or your pastor or pastor's wife or leader or leader. Uh, you may not be 100% happy with that, but your trust is this, that God is in charge of that and if God's in charge of that, I will certainly allow my importance to take a back seat because I'm not just taking a, a back seat to that individual, but I'm taking a back seat to God. That's what real humility is. Can you say amen? See, and just one more statement about those who are reluctant in, the, uh, in the humility. Well, I don't have to respect the pastor, so I'm going to respect them. I have to respect my wife, my husband, because that's how it goes. If that's you, you're actually a contributor to chaos when you do that. Because you're showing those around you, and everybody's looking at you. Don't think for a moment that you're not, because they all are. They're looking at how you act, how you respond, how you peacock, how you don't, how you withdraw and, and, and don't around certain people, how you fail to give compliments. People notice that right away. And if, even if you say, well, I'm just being I just want to say something I'm sorry about later. What you're doing is contributing to the chaos. One last verse here. It's Psalms 1812. We all know it. Humility comes before honor. It does not say that humility comes before primacy or leadership or eminent preeminence, first place. It doesn't mean that if you humble yourself, God's going to give you top dog position. Doesn't say that. That's not what honor is. Honor, in this case, means high respect. God will give you high respect if you take that place of humility. You may not ever achieve that position you want so badly. You may not get that popularity or that notoriety that is causing you to be complete. And you just want it so bad. You may never get that, but God will take notice and give you high respect for it. That word that's used in the original language, high respect, really, with honor, also means integrity. 
means you have the integrity. Give him integrity. Show your integrity. Demonstrate your integrity. Saying, hey, I will submit to you because God has his hand upon you. I don't like everything you do. I don't always agree with everything you do. But I know that God's going to bless you because of who he is and what he's doing on you. And because of that, I will keep my ideas over here until they need to come out over there. I will keep my, my, my desire for notoriety. I will let that go back in order for God to elevate us all. Because humility comes with more high respect. When a church is known for its humility, not its passivity, or passive, or not aggressive, or not gaming, not when it's known for its martyrism, or oh, I'm just doing that thing, but when it's known for real humility, God gives high respect to that church, that ministry, what's going on. Families are known for that very same thing. Are you with me here today? I'm trying to help you us avoid the chaos. Why? Because we've got a big job to do. Much clarity needs to be brought into a confused, disordered world in which we live. Don't you contribute to that chaos. Don't you contribute to the chaos in your family. You can't fix every problem that's going on. You can't sort out all your kids and your spouse and your extended family. That is not your job or your goal. But friend, you can make sure that you're not contributing to it by having this competitive, envious, rivalry kind of attitude, either in home, at work, or in church. Let's bow heads to the church today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to experience you in a full and great way. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that you have shown to us over and over again. Lord, we need you desperately in our times. We ask God for your wisdom. Help us not just to go through 2020 like we have for the last year or two or ten. But, oh God, let us unlearn those things that we have learned. Let us unlearn habits and mindsets that have hurt and hindered your cause. Help us, oh God, to be those new people, those fresh people, those individuals that can make a difference. The wisdom that you've given us, oh God, let it be exemplified through lifestyle. Let us not chase the wind. Help us with this, Lord God. Jesus you're here today and you're not a Christian, the facts wouldn't be honest. I'm not saying that if you're a Christian, you've done some wrong things, but necessarily you've thrown away your faith, because that's not true. But you know when you have. You know when you've just totally given up. You know when you have. And if you have, the time has come to get it right. The time has come to get it right. You need Jesus to get your hand on the cross. Because yeah, if you're not a Christian, you're backslidden today. You need to be there to God. Let's all stand real quick. Brothers and sisters, this competition I've tried to lay out for you as complete as I can. And I know that none of us say, oh, I'm competitive, all that to me. But hopefully, we've been able to kind of pick apart and look at some things that could be problematic in order for you to get it right. Because he will be coming with your honor. God, he wants to highly respect you. But you're going to have to demonstrate that humility, to have that proper level of importance at those things and say, thank you, Lord, for helping. Being spiritually and emotionally. Is God speaking to you? I, I, I know He is, okay? I know that. Do you need to respond? Well, that's something you're going to have to decide. And if you think you need to make an altar call, then just come on over. Our conference is free. Let's take a couple of minutes. Maybe you need to work on humility. Maybe you need to work on rivalry. Maybe you allow that to enter into your work or your home or your church or your uh, ministry. It's possible that. You felt that. Maybe you never put that label on it. I recognize that. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. 
You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M36 BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling, and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you, and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you, we're praying for you, and once again, thank you for listening.